Greg's best known for being the president of Continental Airlines uh, when they turned that around here and kind of wish he was back. But uh, it, uh, he's had a great success. He now leads CCMT Capital as the chairman and chief executive. Uh, it has around 15 billion under a of assets under management. He was also very active as a CEO of several of them, or president of several other companies besides Continental. He was with TWC and also with uh, Burger King. Uh, Greg serves on a lot of boards, Home Depot being the one particularly the lead director. He's also kind of a renaissance man. He ended up writing a book right away and all at once, which he will actually talk about. Uh, he also, believe it or not, won an Emmy, which I didn't know. Uh, he ended up helping getting a, a friend of ours that uh, had a film, uh, and uh, Greg was sponsoring that and actually won an Emmy, so he is an all-around dude. Uh, he's married to Rhonda, they've got three kids. He's an avid Baylor fan uh, since his kids went there. I forgot to do a shout out to TCU for, uh, for Will. And uh, without further ado, I want to introduce Frank Brennan. Thanks, Thanks, Scott. I think uh, Will and I usually have our mothers do these introductions, but, uh, but Kyle, you may, have, uh, you may have taken their place, so they're going to be upset with you. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, with you today, and particularly to be sandwiched between two really good friends, and Will and Kyle. And Will, thanks for uh, thanks for sharing that. It was absolutely uh, absolutely terrific. Uh, what I wanted to talk about today was uh, was turnarounds and turnarounds in business and turnarounds in life. They asked me to uh, to talk about uh, to talk about that. It's really great to be able to do that in Houston because I think there's just such a uh, camaraderie in Houston between the disciples and the Bible. And, uh, and, and the folks, uh, business folks here in the, in the Houston community. And uh, if you remember, four of the 12 disciples were actually fishermen, right? They were, uh, Jesus recruited them right at the Sea of Galilee as they, were, uh, as they were fishing. And I think the strategy actually of the oil and gas guys, those of you who are in that industry in this room, and the fishermen uh, are exactly the same. You basically throw a line in and pray, right? <laughs> so uh, you have a lot, you have a lot, a lot in common. But uh, I'm going to start by just. They asked me to talk about my book, so I, I figured I'd give you a kind of a shameless plug for why I uh, why why I wrote the book. The book's entitled Right Away and All at Once: Five Steps to uh, Transform Your Business and Enrich Your Life. And. Uh, uh, I wrote, the way this book came about is I had written uh, actually at the request of the Harvard Business Review an article after we turned around Continental called Right Away and All at Once, How We Save Continental Airlines. And uh, that turned into a bestseller at the Harvard Business Review. So there were a bunch of publishers that came and bugged me for about 20 years almost uh, to write a book. And I said, I really don't want to write a book. I can't think of anything that would take more time and be of less value than actually, uh, actually writing a book. And I don't know how many of you, I'm an avid reader, but have ever read David Brooks' uh, book, The uh, Road to Character. If you haven't, it's an absolutely terrific book. Uh, uh, David has kind of found his way to faith through that book. And uh, he talks about two kinds of virtues in there, resume virtues and eulogy virtues, right? Resume virtues are what you all sort of tell Will when you want him to hire you at Quantum. And eulogy virtues are what you want somebody to say at your funeral. Right? You can kind of think about those kind of virtues. And, and writing a book really felt uh, like a resume virtue to me. It just wasn't something I wanted to do. And by the way, never do it again. Uh, uh, but so, so kind of why, why, did I, uh, why did I write it? About 10 years ago, I felt like I needed my own turnaround. You know, I was in my mid-40s and uh, had actually done a number of pretty successful turnarounds in, in, in business. And, uh, and had actually achieved a, a lot from a world point of view. And, uh, and I, uh, but I felt really empty inside. And I wasn't into the sort of normal sins of sex, drug, and, drugs, and rock and roll. But I felt more like the church that Jesus refers to in Revelation and Laodicea. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but in Revelation 3.16, he talks about this church and he says, so because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. So you weren't either on fire or completely off the rails, but you were just kind of in the middle. And I don't know if any of you are at that stage in your life or have gone through that a period like that in your life. But I did, and so I actually took the five steps I used to turn around businesses, essentially, and said, I wonder if I could turn around me. So I actually tried. I uh, did the five steps. I'll describe them in a second. And it worked. 
And then I told my friends about it that were kind of experiencing the same thing, and, and it worked for them too. So the only reason I agreed to write the book is because I found a publisher that was dumb enough to allow me to integrate both the business steps and the life steps side by side and talk about those. And, uh, and that all of a sudden kind of felt like a eulogy virtue, that it might be something worth doing. I then actually, before I got it published, I sent it out to a few friends. I sent it to Mitt Romney, who some of you may have heard of, is a Mormon guy uh, that ran for president. I sent it to Jamie Dimon, who's a, a, a Jewish guy, is a chairman and CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase. Some of you may be here from J.P. Morgan Chase. I sent it uh, to, Kyle obviously read it. I sent it to Eric Weinemeyer. Uh, Eric is a blind guy who's climbed all seven summits, kayaked the Grand Canyon, paraglides blind. He's agnostic, by the way. Uh, not for long, I hope. Uh, who's a good buddy of mine. I was with him last weekend uh, in, in Colorado. And then I sent it to Tim Keller, who I figured Tim Keller, if you've ever heard of Tim or any read anything he did, uh, he's a famous pastor and writer, best-selling writer, and I thought, well, if Tim read it and said I wasn't like way off the rails, it would probably be good. And uh, they all sent back kind of endorsements for it, so I said, well, that, that must be good. And then we, uh, we released it in February, and uh, uh, in December it was actually named one of Fortune's five best business books, not talking about faith books. Uh, so, uh, so, so hopefully you can, uh, you can pick it up and, and read it sometime. But I'd really like to talk today about developing eulogy virtues, not resume virtues, and how to integrate uh, faith and life and work, not try and balance them. Because if you try and balance them, it, it won't work. Before I do that, and I'm going to fly through that real quick, because the last thing Kyle whispered to me is stay on time. Um, I just <laughs> ask, ask you a simple question. Why are you in business? Why are you in business? Kind of an important question. What is your role in the world as a business person? Do you ever think about that? Does that ever cross your mind of all the things you could choose to do, why business? I think Dorothy Sayers does the best job to me of describing and answering what we're in business to do. She was a unique individual, by the way. She graduated, she was born in Victorian England in 1893, graduated from Oxford as one of the first women to graduate from Oxford, was a playwright and a theologian, and she says this. She says, work is not primarily a thing one does to live, but a thing one lives to do. It is or should be the full expression of a worker's facilities the thing in which one finds spiritual, mental, bodily satisfaction, the medium in which one offers himself to job, to God. Do you look at your job that way? Do you look at your job as something that you offer to God? The Bible doubles down on this in a verse that actually will use, and I'll use a slightly different translation, it's of Colossians 23 and 24, where it says, work willingly at whatever you do as though you're working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you inheritance and your reward, and that the master you are serving is Christ. So what is your role in the world? I think for all of us, our role as business people is first and foremost to create jobs. Through jobs, people can actually support their families, their extended families, and have a real purpose in life. And secondly, is to change lives. So think about that as you think about your own job. Now I'm going to give you some business content, okay? Uh, uh, Kyle talked a little bit about what I've done. We've all had a lot of experience. Uh, one of my other good friends, Malcolm Gladwell, who's the author that wrote Blink, Outliers, David and Goliath, some of you may have actually read his books. He actually talks in Outliers about a concept called uh, you need to get 10,000 hours in anything to be good at it, whether it's sports, music, business, you know, healthcare, whatever it is. And, uh, and uh, you know, you can tell by uh, the size of my gut and the lack of my hair, I've got way more than my 10,000 hours in business. So let me give you really quickly uh, five steps that you can use to transform your business. And this kind of works whether you're running a business, whether you have one, or whether you're actually evaluating businesses that you want to buy. You know, in private equity, where Will and I are now, we're constantly evaluating businesses and management teams. And this is a really good prism. Uh, to look through. So step one is have a plan and track your progress, right? In every business that we buy at CCMP, or quite frankly that I ran, I'd write a one-page plan for the business. I'd take out a piece of paper and I'd write market, financial, product, and people. And I'd figure out what are the three to five value levers that if you pull them would actually drive improvement in that business. And it's never any more than that. We'll use the quote about simplicity from Jack Welch. It's absolutely critical in, the, in business. Let me give you an example of this that maybe felt close to home for some of you that look a little more like I do than some of the younger folks in the room. 
So when we walked into Continental, it was a disaster. It was the 10th place airline, 10th out of 10 in on time, 10th out of 10 in baggage handling, 10th out of 10 in customer complaints. Uh, bankrupt twice in 10 years and 10 presidents in 10 years. Other than that, it's a wonderful company. Uh, and uh, so we wrote this plan called the Go Forward Plan. And the market plan was fly to win, the financial plan, fund the future, the product plan, make reliability a reality, the people plan on one page called working together, right? Just a quick example on fly to win. We found the fastest way to make money is stop doing things that lose it. <laughs> kind of funny how that works. And so we looked, I looked at the flight schedule and discovered 18% of the flying was cash flow negative. So I asked the scheduling guys, why do we fly from Greensboro to Green, Greenville eight times a day uh, when there are only two customers on the first flight? And they'd say, well, Greg, it was strategic. And I'd say, well, when does last time it made money? And they'd say, well, it never did. I'd say, how strategic could that be? And couldn't we just charter a Learjet to get you and your girlfriend back and forth? Because it would be a lot cheaper than running all these planes. So that's, uh, that, that's how a plan and track your progress. The second thing in business is build a fortress balance sheet. You know, the, uh, uh, in our business, again, in private equity, we're like a long-dated option. You just want to make sure nobody shortens the date on you, right? You know, they're where you run out of cash. And that's mainly have enough cash and have your debt maturities match your asset base, essentially. The best example I got of that was in the fall of 08. I don't know how many of you remember it, the great financial crisis. I went in to go see my good buddy, Jamie Dimon. And I walked in at 9 o'clock in the morning to J.P. Morgan Chase into Jamie's office, and his hair was all messed up, and his sleeves were rolled up. And I don't know how many of you know Jamie. You've probably seen him on TV. He's the most dapper guy in the world. And I said, Jamie, you look like crap. And he said, well, Greg, he said, I canceled. I said, I'm going to get out of here. I can tell you're really busy and wait for the next call. And Hank Paulson telling you what you need to buy. And, uh, and uh, he said, no, sit down. He said, I cancel all my meetings every day now. And I just wait for the next call to come, right? The next shoe to drop, essentially. I'm, I'm managing. I do it. Well, so I said, how can you kind of keep your head in all that? He said, I have a fortress balance sheet. I said, what do you mean? And he took 10 minutes and took me through every balance sheet item on the J.P. Morgan Chase balance sheet. I said, I'm going to be okay, regardless of what happens here, because we didn't get into mortgages at the wrong time. We didn't do these other things. So have a fortress balance sheet. Make sure you have enough cash. The third thing is think money in, not money out. You have to think about how to grow revenue in business to be successful. You cannot cut your way uh, to prosperity. Every dollar of growth you put on your, in, on your business is worth four times when you go to sell your business than a dollar of cost reduction is. So. Uh, Think money in, not money out. The, the next thing, step four, is build a team, clean house if necessary. So if you think about writing that one-page plan, do it for your business. Sit down and write a one-page plan, and then use that plan without thinking about your existing organization, and actually sort of say, what organization do I need to execute on that plan? What people do I need? When you do that in a really good business, you find out you have about 70% of the right people to get done what you want to get done. When you look at a turnaround, you have about 20%. So in Continental, we let 50 of the 61 officers go when we were doing that turnaround and hired 20 really smart people that could help us get it there. We treated them with dignity and respect on their way out, but it's hard to pull the sled dog out of the ditch with the same dog that was kind of let it in. So uh, you often need to, to uh, get that right organization in place. And then step five, and this is the last of the business content, is let the inmates run the asylum. So after you have the right plan, after you have a fortress balance sheet, after you've thought about how to generate revenue, and after you have the right team, you actually need to empower people to go get it done. Right? And we put in some incentives when we were at Continental, and some of you kind of may remember some of this, where we gave away Eddie Bauer Ford Explorers for perfect attendance. We put in place one incentive, which was a on-time bonus incentive. We had never been better than number 10th out of 10 airlines in on-time. And we sort of said, hey, if we're first in on-time, we'll give you 100 bucks. And every time we're second or third, we'll give you 65 bucks. Not out of your, into your normal paycheck. You get a separate check. Payroll taxes come out of your other paycheck. And it says, thank you for helping us be on time every month. Well, the first month we did that, we went from 10th to 4th. And the next two months and ever after, we were first. Right, because everybody wanted the hundred bucks. I don't have time to tell you all the stories. There were a lot of great stories around the incentives of that. But I did have a flight attendant call me right after we did that. And she said, Greg, do you know what a hundred bucks is to me? I said, I have no idea. She said, I, she was crying. She said, I took my kids to the cereal aisle of the grocery store 
told them to buy all the sugar-coated cereal they want. <laughs> uh, nobody had ever given us anything anymore. A mechanic calls me and he says, do you know what a hundred bucks is to me? And I said, I have no idea. I'm not sure I wanted to know. He said, it's two beers and a table dance. <laughs> I said, that's why, that's why we give you the hundred bucks. Uh, uh, but what was more, what's more important than the five steps to turn around a company is the corollary uh, steps to, uh, to turn around your life. And this is what made the most difference to me is when I went in and really, was, uh, really took a look at my life. So step one, remember, was have a plan and track your progress. Step one in life is stay focused with some simple life rules. How many of you have ever played poker? How many of you play poker? Eh, you're kind of admitting it in a Christian setting. That's good. <laughs> uh, 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 the, uh, uh, in poker, you have red chips, white chips, blue chips, right? Blue chips, 25 bucks. Red chips, 10 bucks. White chips, a buck. Well, in our life, what we tend to do is make to-do lists, right? Either mentally or actually physically. And all the things, if you read down your to-do list, I guarantee you, go do it when you get back to the office. They'll all be white chips. Because we like crossing those things off. So you need to do a retrospective and sort of think, what are the real blue chip things in my life? What do I want to make sure are my eulogy, are my eulogy virtues? What do I want to get done? I'm just going to read mine to you to give you kind of a sense of how this works. I said, I use the five Fs, faith, family, friends, fitness, finance, to do this. So I said, in faith, I'm a Christian. I believe in the resurrected Christ and the desire to become an intimate of God's. A.W. Tozer, famous theologian, has a statement, God doesn't have favorites, he does have intimates. So how do you become an intimate of God's? Um, if you don't have that belief, actually, Kyle's going to talk a little, in a little bit, but talk to somebody here before you leave, because uh, it, it would be well worth spending some time talking more about that. In family, I said, I believe my most important relationship is with my wife, Rhonda, my most important legacy with my three kids, and my obligation is to show my parents I value them. So what steps do I need to take to do that? I have this kind of fun saying that says, happiness is when the kids leave and the dog dies. And if you manage your marriage, <laughs> that's actually true. Um, and friends, I said, I, find that I value an enduring lifetime relationships with those I'm close to. Fitness, I want to take care of myself, so if at all possible, I do everything in my power to have good health throughout my life. And finance, I believe I should give my best effort to those whose money I'm stewarding and then be a faithful servant by trying to give it all back in my lifetime. So, can I get rid of all my money in my lifetime? I had an uncle that did that, I don't have time to talk about, but it's pretty amazing. He became a millionaire when millionaires weren't cool, and he died at 99 and went broke at 97. Intentional. That's pretty cool. Uh, the second step, remember, was have a fortress balance sheet. In life, I call that choose freedom. Make sure that your finances and life become your faithful servant and not a relentless master. You can't achieve your life goals, your blue chips in life, if you're actually beholden to somebody else financially. So you have to kind of clean that up. Remember in business, step three was think money in, not money out. In life, it's exactly the opposite. Think money out, not money in. Provide for those in need. If you look across every single uh, faith and non-faith based worldview, agnostics, atheists, uh, the Jewish people, uh, Muslims, uh, Islam, Christianity, the one thing they all agree on is generosity is important. Generosity is the only path to happiness and the only cure to materialism. That's true in every single worldview. Step four, remember, was build a team in your business that allows you to accomplish your plan. In life, it's the same. And I want to give you a little hint here, because this doesn't sound that cool, but it actually works really well. Think about Jesus. He had the four that he was closest to, the 12 disciples, the 72, and then essentially the masses, right? That's how he managed his life in concentric circles. If you think about your own life, and you've got to take your family outside of this because you have a special obligation there, I guarantee you there's somebody in your life that's like Eeyore and Winnie the Pooh that takes 80% of the time and adds very little of the value to helping you accomplish your goals. <laughs> Chances are, if they're that to you, you're that to them, too. You don't have to get rid of them as a friend. Just kind of move them out a little bit. Instead of meeting them every day, meet them once a month, the conversations get a lot better. Trust me, it works. But you need to surround yourself with people that actually can energize you. And that's what really Kyle and Hal Chappelle and Bill Nath are to me. We meet every Sunday morning. 6.30 to 8.30 before church, and encourage each other. We pray for each other. We 
study uh, scripture together, we memorize scripture together. It, we've been doing it for a decade now. It makes a world of difference. If you don't have a group like that, find one. And then step five, remember, was let the inmates run the asylum. And step five in life is invest in family and friends. And I'll tell you just a final story of a buddy of mine that does that better than anybody I've ever seen, Britt Harris. Britt is the CIO of Texas Teachers, uh, third largest pension fund in the country. Uh, Britt was the CEO of Bridgewater, which is the largest hedge fund, making a ton of money, decided he wanted to get back in the second half of his life, and came back to Texas because his mom was a school teacher, and he thought the way he could help was to invest the money for the teachers of Texas. That Texas Teachers, by the way, has by far the highest returns of any public pension fund in the United States. Britt's been there about 10 years. But Britt didn't stop there. He actually, some of you are Aggies, he started a class at Texas A&M called Titans of Investing, which is basically a life skills class, sort of wrapped in a fancy title. He bought a house next to the university. Instead of a key on the house, he's got a passcode. For 11 years, he's had 20 terrific kids a semester. He knows where every single kid his is. He's helped them to get jobs. And they all have the code to that house. So he's turned then the house into basically a place where they have refuge and can actually interact with each other. Folks, that's a eulogy virtue. When Britt, you know, when Britt looks back over his life, he's going to say, I've got hundreds of kids I've actually poured into in a thoughtful way. And I just challenge you as you leave today, think about what those blue chips are in your life. What eulogy virtues do you want to leave? I'm going to turn it back over to Kyle, and I think he's going to tell a little bit about his life story and, and how to integrate your faith in your life. So, thank you.